The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. And joining us now, as we said earlier, we have uh, two special guests, and uh, they're part of the book called The Program, and it's Inside the Mind of Keith Rainier and the Rise and Fall of Nexium. So we have Tony, Tony Natalie and Chet Hardwin. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. We appreciate it. Thank you. So um, now to begin with, uh, Tony, um, first of all, how did you decide to write a book about your experience, and why did you do that? Well, you know, as this process has unfolded over the last 20-odd years, I've had people, especially Chet, say to me, you know, someday I have to write a book. And when Chet would tell me that, I would say to him, well, we have to have an ending because a good book always has to have a good ending. And when Keith was, when it looked like we finally had found um, the authorities that were going to actually do something, actually take a look into this criminal organization and stop what was going on and had been going on for decades, I started putting together the documents for the, for the federal government to turn over to them. And what that did was gave Chet and I kind of like, I call it the bones or the basics, the, you know, the, the guts of the book, because it was putting it together for an authority, for the authorities, so it was timelines dozens and dozens of timelines as Chuck can attest to and then documents to support those timelines and different things that have had transpired over the last 20 years so um, the book also was a healing it was taking all of the things that happened and putting them down on paper and getting everything out and hopefully it will help educate and show people that you can survive something like this with a good support system and uh, look, how to look for those flags, those that coercive control that goes on because what people think today or thought was a cult, they're, you know, it's very, it's become very mainstream. So now, Tony, you are considering yourself uh Patient zero is what you say. Um, how how is it that you and Keith got uh, intertwined? I met Keith in the early '90s when he was running a company called Consumers Byline. It was again a multi-level marketing company that that saved people on goods and services. And you know the thing that I'd like people to keep in mind is when I met Keith, it was in the early '90s. We we are very spoiled in the sense that we have computers in our hands today. So if someone asks us a question that we're not quite sure of, we do something called Google it. Well, back then there was no, right? True. Yes. Yeah. Um, back then there was, there was no Googling. You looked into the eyes of the person that was speaking to you and you accepted the fact that why would they lie? And presented, they were presented in a way that really, his calling card was I have a 240 IQ. I'm the smartest man in the world and I'm going to change things. And I think innately we're all good. So if someone presents themselves in a way that can help us to better ourselves and show us a better way of doing things in the world, I think that we're open to that kind of a suggestion and that kind of a, of a concept. And that's how I met Keith. It was, it was, you know, that same thing of warm market, a friend introducing a friend. So, um, the concept was consumers by line, and that's how I originally got involved with them. But back in the 90s, there was no Rick Allen Ross Cult Institute to Google and see what was um, what was there, um, and and help you to help you to find your way in in, in a coercive control or cult type group. Okay, so now, Tony, wh what was your first impression of him? Like, did you did you find him to be a warm person, a nice person? Uh, be, uh, what what was your impressions? Well, you know, when when somebody says you're about to meet the smartest man in the world, or one of the smartest men in the world, I don't know. My expectations were a little different than what I saw. He was very unassuming, 
almost shy. Chet laughs at me because I pronounce it incorrectly, but he looked like little Lord Faulkner to me. He had little round glasses and bowl haircut, and he bounced when he walked. And he was he was shy and and um, and and very his, his the the way he presented himself at that point was you know the the fair haired boy from Troy was a story that they wrote about him in the Albany area. He was very much representing this young idealistic man that was going to do things to change the world and save people money and make the world a better place. So what I expected was not what I saw and that what I saw I thought was pretty pretty remarkable and I was interested in learning more about it as were the 250,000 people that were and took took place in Consumers Byline. But you didn't feel threatened by him? Oh no, not at all. No, no, very unassuming, very sweet, very gentle, um, listened, kind, quiet. No, not threatened whatsoever. So what was Consumer Bylines then? Consumer Byline was a consumer-based organization that saved you um, hundreds or thousands of dollars on your goods and services, depending on how much you use the membership. It was a multi-level marketing concept, as everything Keith ever did was, because he is a frustrated Amway salesman. Is <laughs> what's going on with him? <laughs> he had started with Amway and, um, you know, built himself to branding. I, I, I don't know. Uh, so it was a consumer-based organization and a multi-level marketing company. Wow. So how did it turn into Nexium? Like, what what was the uh, first thing you noticed that was a change? Well, Consumers Byline was shut down by 22 attorney generals and two federal agencies back in the early 90s. And from that point, Keith and I opened up a company called National Health Network. It was a supplement uh, organization, again, with a multi-level aspect to it because everything Keith does has an MLM arm to it. But the concept between, behind that was saving people money on their supplements and their food and connecting traditional doctors with alternative doctors. And it was a great concept. It just wasn't going to give Keith the platform. He wasn't going to be a Dallasized as he was with, even with Consumers Byline. I mean, our meetings were anywhere from 500 to 5,000 people in a room, mostly men, not there for self-help improvement but for their, there to build a business. And then National Health Network was a lot of people interested in health. So Keith wasn't the big draw there. The big draw was the savings. And when he met Nancy Selzman, who was also one of his co-defendants, that's where the transition came in. Nancy Selzman claimed to be the number two NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programmer, in the world. And she had an ability um, and a background on brief therapy hypnosis, so was was uh, capable and pretty proficient at people that are susceptible to hypnotic suggestion, um, uh, putting them into a certain, as she calls it, state. And when Keith saw Nancy present what she had been doing for years with some pretty major corporations, he saw his next best move because that was going to get him where he wanted to be and and what he really felt he was the vanguard so she gave him that permission so what went on in 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 the meetings um anything special or in the yeah, when you I, guys had your group meetings together like what what were they what would they consist of well, I went through the I went through the initial what I call the pilot program for executive success program. So originally, the the first name for Nexium was ESP Executive Success Program, and I think that in 2003, when the Forbes article came out and kind of pulled back a piece of the curtain, they realized they needed to do something so that the media couldn't catch up. So that coupled with, as I explained in the book, what is believed to be the concept of the name the name changed, so it was a little bit more difficult for people to follow. But what I experienced in the breakout groups that I went through 
in that pilot program were the sessions, as Nancy called them, that I was having with Nancy for over a year to help me with my deep-rooted problem, which was the fact that I was molested as a child. So that molestation was the root of all of my problems, and she was going to help me through them. And I saw bits and pieces of our, what I, as much as I could recall in our sessions, kind of popping out. I call it like a shutter shot. You know, when you take a picture of a camera and you see that click. And to me, it was disturbing that there was, that was therapy. And there were people sharing what I consider now to be early, early collateral by sharing their secrets with people that, A, didn't have any kind of uh, uh, educational background or authority to do this type of therapy and that it would be used later for them against them as a, as a way to convince them maybe to help out with things or you really don't want that shared it was it was how he started originally and 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 as i see have seen how he gets into that crack and then escalates so it started off with just kind of sharing basic things and it moved all the way into naked photos of you, of naked photos and, and other things as we saw, um, with the DOS. So now maybe explain what DOS was. DOS was a claim to be, but DOS was a female, what they presented it as like a, a female sorority. So it was, it was presented to some of the girls as a like a, a, a boot camp for women or a sorority for women. And it was supposed to be just for women, about women. And what it turned out to be in, in all, what it was, was Keith Webb of kind of living out all of his fantasies. So how did you and Chet get uh, together? Chat, you want to answer that one? Sure. Uh, I was, um, I was a, I had just started a new job in Albany, New York. I was the news editor of the Alternative News Weekly there, and I think I was my first month there, and I got a cold call from a former consultant with Nexium who wanted to uh, hand over some documentation and uh, that he felt was uh, would make Nexium look bad and also wanted to connect me with Tony so that she could tell her story. Um, so I went and I met with this with this former consultant and uh, the document proved to be very valuable and uh, started talking to Tony and within two months, I, uh, we had a story out. It was the first real sort of local expose into Nexium and uh, and Keith. Um, and Tony and I just kept in touch after that. I did some stories after that. Uh, I I believe I I was the first person to report about Allison Mack being a member of Nexium. And uh, yeah, we just stayed in touch and uh, watched as all of this transpired over the past thirteen years. So now, now Tony, I was going to say. So, uh, how long were you involved with uh, Rainier? I met Keith in '91, and I left in '99. And the last thing he said to me before the last words out of his mouth that I heard him say was, "The next time I see you, you will be dead or in jail." Wow. And I, yeah, well, and I'm here to tell you, he tried very hard to make one or both of those things come true. He was half right because as we'd learned from the Eastern District of New York, he really isn't that smart because in their, um, in the indictment that they presented, they showed that he was barely passing his grades. So he was only half right. The next time I saw him, he was in jail. And to much to his shock as he came through the door, he saw me and I saw him and was like, bye. So what was it that, uh, led you to leave? What were the first cracks that you saw in uh, what he was up to? 
Well, you know, I had I had met Keith and started a relationship with him and moved to Albany. And when I was uncomfortable with what was going on, I tried to break it off. And this was early on in our relationship. And he came, you don't leave Keith. He came back pretty hard at, you know, I'll give you all of the things you and your, your son need. I understand what you want. And for a short amount of time, I mean, for several years, he did try to provide that stability that we needed. And then when he met Nancy, we were starting to have problems before he met Nancy Salzman. Things were starting to unravel a bit. I was working a lot of hours, and my parents had moved to the area because my my mom, my greatest advocate, um, my greatest support, was not happy about what was going on and decided she and my dad will return. Why not come and get closer to me? And when Nancy came along, they started they started to formulate what is now known as Nexium. And part of me was was kind of relieved and I thought, okay, well he'll go off and do that and and you know, we'll be I'll just continue to run the company that I'm doing, raise my child and 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 we'll see where it goes from there. But what happened with the with um, ESP and with his ability to have his I keep saying his next best Keith just constantly replaces the people in his life to take everything that they bring to the table out, draw it out, use it, and then push them aside. And when he met Nancy and was able to create this platform of executive success program, he no longer really wanted to play that role of boyfriend and co-parenting partner. And when he wanted me to call him Vanguard and and you know the adolescizing was becoming so prevalent people were bowing to him and it was it, it there was a shift that wasn't something that I was willing to stay or participate in that's when things started to get uh, violent in our relationship and and go in a direction that wasn't safe for my child or something that I wanted to be involved in so I I tried to leave thinking, actually my brother came in to try to help me to leave, but the, uh, the ask was much too big. So we, uh, uh, we just, we laughed. I sent, my son went back to live with his father who I thank God for because he is the one that raised him and took care of him when I was not capable of doing so. And, um, and kind of put my head down thinking that it eventually it will go away. And it just never did. I mean, when Keith was arrested in March of 2017, he was still suing me in the state of Washington and trying to have me and several other people extradited to Mexico on false charges. I call it terrorism by litigation. I mean, his relentless pursuit of his enemies or anyone he feels um, is a detractor or uh, you know, a, a suppressive as, as I've been so well labeled. He will, when, when you have endless amounts of money behind you. So the, the thing that's funded Nexium all these years is the fortune of the Brothman sisters. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that Mike is well aware of, of who they are, mm -hmm. uh, given you're up in Kadena. And, you know, it, when you don't care what the outcome of a lawsuit is, you just continue to sue. And, and if you're on the receiving end of that, you have to you have to fight back. So you're constantly defending yourself over frivolous things that that in the end doesn't really matter to them if it's a quote unquote win or lose in their in their box. It's did they destroy you? Did they break you physically, financially, emotionally? And anyone that's been in a long-term litigation understands what that's like. Uh, well, did, did he actually, well, did Keith actually feel threatened by you? Like when you guys parted ways, did he feel like you were going to attack him? No, I think with Keith that if he can't own you, he has to destroy you. So what I, I think what I represented for him was that he was infallible. No one had ever left Keith. The women that were with him then 
are some of the same women that were with him when he was arrested. Uh, you know, two of them had passed away. A few of them had left earlier in, you know, years earlier. But the core group that helped enable him to do what he's done, he's, he's lazy. So what Keith is more than anything is lazy. And what he does is he puts like, a, like a lot of cult leaders, they find producers, people that are hard workers, people that can, um, that will do the work that they won't do. And without those enablers, he would have never been able to succeed where he did. They, they, through the trial, they very brilliantly laid out how this core group of women were well aware of, so he, so let me digress. He presented himself as a renunciate, a celibate monk, a renunciate. So now you have this illusion of a man with a 240 IQ who's a celibate monk, who's a renunciate, who has no need for material things once. And the women that were helping to perpetuate this lie all knew about each other and were all sleeping with him. So they helped to insulate him and be able and help him to be able to further that that perceived notion of uh, you know this guru type of a, an individual with all of the accolades and all of the the brilliance that you would want in someone to teach you a better way to do things. So he must have had quite a charisma, quite a quite a style, like Charlie Manson or something that people were drawn to him. Very much so. I mean, you know, I've had a lot of attorneys that I've met with over the years because I'm sadly not the only person that Keith has sued. And they say, you know, what is it? You know, like, what is it about him? And the thing is, he listens. He listens and listens and listens and he waits until he hears your strength and he waits until he hears your weaknesses and he uses both of them against you. And you have no idea it's happening because he's, he was so unassuming. There was, it was, there was a gentleness almost to him where I know inside now that that was just, you know, it was just a facade, but it wasn't something that it's a slow, slow drip. It's a very slow drip the way he does this because people say, well, how does someone get, let themselves be branded? Well, it just doesn't happen that way. Those girls were some of them in Nexium for quite a long time. And then they were, already indoctrinated, already predisposed to, you know, uh, some, sort of some sort of collateral if they did not do what they should have done, and, and calling him vanguard and submitting to the will of the prefect and the vanguard. So if you were already predisposed to certain things, he just kind of handpicked and kept drawing people along. And the... And, and in some cases, it wasn't him that kept them there. It was the person that brought them in that kept them there. So it, it went down, it reached down into levels um, or generations. So now explain that, that uh, branding or tattoo that you guys had on your bodies. Okay, so I never had a brand or a tattoo. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was... Uh, that was something that was done much later with a very selective group of young women. And that was after years of Keith indoctrinating them into, as I said, they would start with, there was Nexium or ESP. And then from that, there was another organization called Janas, which was a women's group you know, created by a man, but for women. So it's kind of like the distilling down, and you keep distilling down until you get the people that, okay, I've pushed them this far. Let me see just how much further I can push them. It's the ex es escalating of a psychopath. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. So the branding, to the best of my knowledge, did not occur until I believe it was 2015. And, and in, and in a good or a bad way, that was the tipping point. You, you can't brand your initials on people's bodies. It was enough. Sadly, all the things that were done to people for decades before that was not enough to bring the authorities in, not for lack of trying, because we tried, but this was the thing that, that finally pushed it over the edge where, okay, we really need to take a look at this organization. And I guess, thank God, because I think that if he got 
women to go to that extreme, well, the next extreme would have been, you know, someone's death, although there's death involved in this, but a deliberate something else that he would get someone to do. What do you think the the scariest thing that uh, you ever saw him do was? Scariest thing. Like to any of the, any of the members, any of the people involved in the in the group, did was he? Um, uh, did he kind of uh, beat people or attack people or anything like that? No, there's. I never saw, a, 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 you know, rape as a physical thing, so uh, let's not slight that. But, he, I mean, Keith, it's a, it's a mental abuse, and it's control. So it's taking someone and, and breaking them down until you, he breaks people down and then he rebuilds them into what he wants. So what's the worst thing I ever saw him do? Uh, destroy my child's childhood. I mean, for me personally, attack my parents. Um, be relentless with my brother to the point where, you know, uh, he, he passed away in 2009. The cause of death was suicide. Do I think my brother decided today I'm going to swallow a bottle of pills and die? No, but I think that he was pushed to the point where he just couldn't get Keith to leave us alone. And he was tired. And I think he overmedicated. So the worst thing I ever saw him do was just not leave us alone. I mean, I we wouldn't be having this discussion if he had left me alone. I'd be watching from the sidelines and going, wow, I dated that guy. I dodged a bullet. But his relentless pursuit was, was um, I don't know. People say to me, how did you do this? And I would say, I didn't have a choice. Because if you, w what were my options? What do you think he wanted uh, to do to you? Like, what 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 was his end game for you? Um, did did he actually want you dead, or? Yeah, I think if he could have, if he could have had, if that could have happened um, without it pointing a finger at him, yeah, probably. He um, control. I mean, Keith, Keith, a, a psychopath. It's about control and power. So what he wanted to do was control me. And because he could not control me, he wanted to destroy me. Mm -hmm. and, and it's me or anyone else that has ever left him that actually spoke out or stood up. There was a box of documents at the courthouse with dossiers on the enemies list. Chet was on the enemies list. And, you know, reporters or uh, the the attorneys that even even some of their own attorneys, uh, Edgar Brofman Sr. I mean, they were. They, he causes a sense of paranoia within the organization, so that there's always a bad guy. And I think narcissists, uh, people that are part of a course of control mindset, it's what they do. There has to be a bad guy. So he creates the illusion of perceived enemies so that instead of people watching him do what he's doing, they're watching this other person. Sleight of hands. So, Chet, what was your relationship with uh, uh, Keith, um, being that you were on the hot list? Did, did you guys have any interactions? Uh, yeah, I met with Keith once. I also met with Nancy uh, Saltzman, uh, the president of... Nexium. Um, I met with Keith at a volleyball game. His, he, they were, uh, Nexium was suing the newspaper I worked for. They were, um, in New York State, you file an intent to sue, and we were served with this intent to sue. And they were going to sue, they said, for $65 million um, for something that I had written uh, a year earlier. So I met with Keith at a volleyball game. It was him and uh, I think Claire Bronfman was there. Uh, Allison Mack was there. And a f f quite a few others. No, no, no one whose names you would recognize. And um, it was at midnight, and we, we played until about, you know, four. And uh, Keith and I spoke for a while. It was, you know, it was about as odd as you would expect it to 
be when you're meeting a cult leader for a midnight game of volleyball. Right. <laughs> right. I, I would say. Um, <laughs> but was he real assertive with you or aggressive? No. Or, no. no, he's not. And that's, that goes back to what Tony was saying. Keith is... Um, Keith is so unassuming, um, and he's 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 so just um, you know. If you saw if you walked into a room full of people, uh, you, Keith would not be the one that sticks out to you. You know, I mean, um, you know, bringing up Charles Manson, you walk into a room full of people, Charles Manson's going to stand out, right? Uh, even before he before that. Yeah. Uh, Keith didn't. Keith wouldn't. Keith Keith looks like you know um, he could be. Ah, he looks like he could be anything. You know, uh, uh, like a college professor or, or you know uh, a salesman. I mean, he doesn't. He does not strike you as a as a cult leader. And at that volleyball game, uh, he didn't. He didn't intimidate me. He didn't. Uh, he didn't threaten me. Um, he just tried to uh, to win me over. It was it was his constant attempt to get me to be on his side, uh, to to align myself with him, or to to accept uh, you know to accept an offer from him. Um, I was reporting at the time they were they were trying to bring the Dalai Lama. They they had arranged to bring the Dalai Lama to Albany for a Nexium event. It wasn't next. It was a company under Nexium, under the Nexium umbrella, essentially. And I had been reporting about that because the Daily Paper hadn't, um, and uh, they weren't happy about that. That's why they. That's why they filed that intent to sue. So, so you think the lawsuit was more about control and getting control over you and the paper? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The the. The deal, the deal that Keith floated was, you know, um, I stop writing about Nexium, uh, and Keith gives me, um, Keith doesn't file the suit, and he gives me an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview. That was the that was the deal I was supposed to mull over. <laughs> well, there. <laughs> There you have it. What was what, yeah. what was the most shocking thing for you to learn when you were doing the book? Uh, the, the the most well for me personally the most shocking thing during that was during the trial, um, and the, you know Tony and I were at that trial from day one to 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 the very end, and uh, Tony before day one she was at the pretrial hearings, um, and the most. There were so there were so many moments that were uh, traumatizing uh, for for everybody who had to listen to it, and traumatizing for the people who were reliving it. And um, I, well, the most shocking it's it's hard to it's hard to put it it's hard to like pick one of these things out and say this this was more shocking than another. But um, I think it's how much time Keith spent. Um, controlling the women around him, like you, I never really put that together. They went through all the text messages that Keith would send to his uh, to this sixteen year old girl he was grooming and 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 raping, um, and th the text messages he would send to all the women and uh, the emails he would send out. This was a full time job for him, just keeping just keeping his control over the women in his inner circle. Um, he, he, spent, he, he, he texted as much as you would expect like a teenager to text. It was kind of embarrassing at some points listening to these texts. But that was the most shocking to me. It was just the amount of energy he exerted uh, controlling all of these women around him. So now um, he eventually got arrested, and uh, what, what ended up happening in court for him? Well, he was. Oh, go ahead. Oh. Go ahead, oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, he was convicted on uh, every count. Um, he's going to be sentenced in January. Uh, Tony's going to be reading a. Uh, Tony's going to be delivering a victim impact statement um, at that. And, but the, yeah, he, the, he all of his co-conspirators pled guilty, um, 
and uh, they didn't even go to trial. And yeah, Keith went through seven weeks of trial. It was all laid out, and he was convicted on all all seven counts. But then I think Tony, the jury took like four and a half hours to deliberate, and they had lunch. <laughs> and they had lunch. <laughs> well, that's important, you know. Right, their last government meal, they had lunch. Yes. Yeah. Well, you got to have, you know, you got to convict on a full stomach. That jury was amazing. They were really amazing. What they had to sit through was um, unbelievable, and they were attentive and on point and professional. I take my hat off to them. They were quite amazing. It seems like I guess most of his convictions were related to trafficking and sex trafficking and forced labor, right? It was racketeering, racketeering conspiracy, forced labor conspiracy, wire fraud conspiracy, sex trafficking of one of the victims, and attempted sex trafficking of another one of the victims. Wow. Um, have you heard from him since the trial or conviction, or is he trying to sue either one of you again? Or I think he's busy. Um. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> no, you really never know with Keith. Um, no, uh, I, no, he, you know, the, the nonverbal communication that went on during the trial between Keith and I became almost a, a bit of a banter. It was kind of fun. Um, NLP has certain modalities that you use and, he would he would try to do some of those things and then he just got frustrated and as his glasses glasses would slide down the front of his face he'd use his middle finger and push his glasses up and <laughs> glare at me so I'd use my middle finger and I'd brush my bangs back and and this was it was almost comical because it it got to the point where almost jurors were kind of leaning looking over to see like who is he glaring at be like hey. Uh, <laughs> So no, he he hasn't. You know, he hasn't sent me any letters from prison. I'm I'm open to it though. Maybe mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I'd love to hear from him. Yeah, I would think. Well, you know, he's got a lot of time if he's in prison. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's taking up knitting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you never know. It, it could be a, a next profession. Um, he's starting an in, in jail cult. Well, sadly, from what I understand, he's been caught with two cell phones. So you know. The not so funny part of this is, is the fact that he still feels so entitled. Mm -hmm. And who the hell is he calling? And the Brockmans still have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Right. And a sociopath is never going to change. No, never, never. Small playbook, different players. It's just the same thing. So I do wait. You know, I'm still very careful and cautious with my actions and where I go and what I do because, as you say, you never know there's more of a chance that he will than he won't. So, But at least at this point, the world is aware of who he is and what he is. Whereas before all of this, um, for a long time, I was the only one yelling, hey, there's a crazy man in the room, and why can't anyone see that? And then people started to kind of come on and, and get involved and, and, and rep repeat the same thing and see the same patterns. But even in bringing things to the attorney general's documents and proof of what was going on and being told, you know, we'll get back to you. <laughs> Stop sending things. We'll get back to you. <laughs> so do you do you feel like he still has people uh, out there who are um, fans of his, like Manson had Squeaky Fromm and, and people like that who stayed with, quote-unquote, the family for years afterward and is still worshipped Charlie. Do you think there's people out there like that for Keith? I do. Mm. I do. I, I saw them in court. So he did have people that are in court, that were in court or tried to get into court every day. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Did they shave their head? And <laughs> you know, here's the thing. The... the the, the one thing that uh, um, an organization, a self-help organization like this does, for the most part, it draws good people because I don't think anyone jo wants to join a cult. And they go into this wanting to learn a better way and a better, a better modality of doing things. And they look, the thing, the reason for the program, the reason for writing the book is in part to show people the signals, the red flags, the things to look for because, no, they don't shave their head. They look like the girl or the boy next door or your office mate. And this type of coercive control, indoctrination, 
doesn't happen to just a select few. It could happen to anyone. And, you know, Chet and I have talked about this. Had he not been prepared for what he went into, I mean, these are beautiful people that look like they're having fun and a smart guy. And, and the trappings are all there, which is what, you know, what a cult is, to, to draw people in. And it's how far you're willing to go. What's your moral compass? That's the difference between those that went through and said, well, I didn't have too bad of an experience. You know, I don't, I didn't see it like that. And those that got to the point where they were branded. Mm -hmm. Why did it take so long for people to jump to, to jump on the Nexium cult bandwagon, so to speak? Like it, it seemed to take a while for the authorities. For the to authorities, come yeah. I think it's political um, connections and money. Yeah. I mean the 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 charges the the charges that were lodged against me and several other people that were absolutely blatantly false were, were absurd and. The attorneys that worked with, with, with the people that were being charged with either the criminal side of this or the civil side of this, journalists from Vanity Fair, or from New York, from um, the Albany Times Union, and myself and other people, to them it was so absurd. Like, this is ridiculous. These, these are ridiculous charges. And were, the civil charges were proven to be false because of Claire Brothman's perjury. Yet nothing was done. So what we understand in the world of law is that if you perjure yourself, there's consequences. Not if you're Claire Brothman. Not if you have that kind of money. So I think the influence and the power in Albany is a cesspool. You know, it's just full of corruption. Wow. So now, what do you hope people get out of the book when they read it? I hope that they get an understanding that you know, you, you, you can survive things. You don't really think that you can. I mean, you, you can come on the other, come out the other end of this standing and, and what to look for. And how, what I tell people is at the end of the day, I don't want to be that person that doesn't trust the next person that comes to me because then he wins. So how are you able to protect yourself in a way where you know what to look for? What are the flags? What are the signs? And how do you how do you help other family members that may be in a cult or a coercive control relationship to get out without scaring them away and letting them know that they they do have a place to go that there is a safe spot you just always have to keep your mind and your heart open for them. So now um, the book is available everywhere, and uh, we'll have that on our website as well. Now, do you have a um website or a place that people can contact you or do you stay hidden no <laughs> no chet and i are right chet and i are right out there aren't we chet um, <laughs> it's, we have a website called the fall of nexium and we have a, a spot on the website where people can contact us where they can share their experiences either publicly or privately um in, in again in a safe space because there's a lot of there's a lot of trolls on the internet. And there's a lot of ways that people bash people that have gone through something like this, and it's hurtful enough to realize you've been duped or what you've believed in all those years didn't turn out to be true. And oh my God, how did I get here? And how many people did I bring into it? Then to go someplace and not have someone that can try on that you, that experience and help you through that and help you understand the process of deprogramming or places that you can go and help that you can get. And in 2020, Chet and I will be doing a podcast called The Fall of Nexium. Well, fantastic. Um, I, I still can't believe people um, would actually uh, say or be mean to others online. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. It's never happened to me. It never happens. To <laughs> Ever. Nothing but love. Well, it's been a real pleasure, and uh, we're glad you took the time to talk about your book and, and about your upcoming podcast and website and everything. And um, again, uh, thank you, Tony, and thank you, Chet. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate yep. your time very much. Thanks thank so you. much. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com.
mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll say it! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.